Ashwagandha is an incredible supporter of, of thyroid health. And it's actually shown to be quite effective for helping horm uh, hormone production in men, specifically of testosterone. And it's not that it stimulates testosterone production directly, they, is what they're finding, um, but that it decreases stress and anxiety so much that the body doesn't have to spend the energy on the production of cortisol. It can downregulate cortisol production, you know, the stress hormone and the adrenaline, and can go back to healthy testosterone production. Um, so it, it takes you out of the fight or flight, so you can, you know, your body can focus on its more long term health strategy rather than Beautiful. purely on immediate you know, uh, uh, survival. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that's an amazing one. It's one of my absolute favorites. Welcome on the show, Sage. Thank you so much for making time. Hey, thank it's you for having me. It's always good to get to spend some time with you, Sebastian. Always. I've known you for a while now, and I've always been impressed about all the knowledge that you hold of so many different topics. Um, today, I would love to talk to you more over the sort of the, the umbrella knowledge that you have around the um, tonic tonic herbalism, which which I guess is rooted in Taoism. But but overall, it would be just awesome uh, to introduce that that knowledge and that philosophy to to the to the listeners, if if you if you don't mind. Absolutely, yeah. So. Um, you know, Taoism in ways is is kind of like where we're going to go is kind of in between a traditional herbal system and, and medicinal system in China and the, the Taoist perspective on it. And Taoism, mm -hmm. it's not really a religion. It's more of a life philosophy, you know, in, in the way that one might look at like Zen or Confucianism in a sense. It's not like a, a, a worshipful religion, but it's more following what they call the way, which is just kind of the way the Taoists would study is they would sit very still and, and observe nature and observe these patterns in nature and, and observe the changing of the seasons and how animals and plants and earth behave and turn that into philosophical knowledge to help us humans. And that extended to their health practices. You know, they built a deep system of Taoist tonic herbalism, which has some things in common with um, elements of the herbal system of traditional Chinese medicine, but it is different in a lot of ways. You know, when you look at a, a lot of uh, TCM, um, what you see is not just tonic herbs, but lots of medicinal herbs. And um, when you're talking about herbs, the Taoists kind of classified them into three groups. You have the uh, poison, the first class of herbs, which is like the poisonous herbs. These are things that you like give to your enemies. You actually, you know, they had these classified as All right. if you were at war and you needed to poison somebody, um, this is what you use. And then the next class up from that was called the inferior herbs or the medicinal herbs. And this is what you take if you are, uh, if you have a particular malady or, or you're sick or something's wrong with you, you have a parasite or you have a bacterial issue, you're, you have uh, you know, cancer, any of these things. And you, there's specific herbs that you would use for each situation to get you better but then you don't keep taking them after that because at a certain point they do have a toxic effect. It's like, uh, you know, maybe some modern drugs, if you were in, you know, we don't like to use uh, antibiotics more than you absolutely need to, but there are certain situations uh, in which they're absolutely necessary and could save your life, but you're not going to keep taking them for the rest of your life just because they save your life one time. Right? So that's how you would look at like an herb, like uh, echinacea or, or golden seal, some of these immune boosting really immune stimulating herbs that you take when you're sick because you want to really ramp up your immune system to, to tackle whatever is going on but you would not keep taking on an ongoing basis because it's going to have detrimental detrimental effects taken for too long so then that's the that's the inferior herbs now they like i said they do have their place um but ultimately what we want to go for is the tonic herbs this is a superior class of herbs um, a very limited number of herbs actually fall into this category and these are herbs that uh, have to be dual directional and adaptogenic, meaning they're not just stimulating you in one direction or another direction. They're not just suppressing your immune system or stimulating your immune system, or they're not just stimulating you energy-wise, like coffee would not be a tonic herb because it's a pure stimulant, right? Uh, it, it's gonna, or, or uh, a sedative, like uh, you know, something like valerian, or, or taking melatonin as a supplement would not be a tonic herb because it's a, a sedative. It's gotta be something that adapts to the internal situation of your body. And so if you are uh, tired, it's gonna help you produce more energy naturally. If you are too stressed, it's gonna calm you down, but it's not acting as a sedative. It just kind of makes you feel a bit more peaceful and adapt 
to the stressful situation. Um, as I said, it'll, it'll balance immunity, helps yeah. you know burn fat, building muscle, all these kinds of things is what we often see in this class of tonic herbs. And they have to build uh, on at least one of the three treasures. Um, and hold on there, hold on there. Second year, because I'm, I'm getting off on a roll here. I guess. Wow, you know, and I'm like, wow, there's so much I want to ask because that's just amazing. I probably would start with the beginning. Like, so, so these people, how did they, like, you know, they weren't scientists. Well, they, they, they were in their own rights, you know, what's that, 3,000 years ago. But how on earth did they figure out what those herbs were doing? Do you, do you know how that actually started? It's, um, you know, it, various herbs have different stories to them. Um, like you, if you look at tea, for example, they, they say that uh, Taoist hermit was sitting writing one day and a leaf happened to fall from the tree and landed in his water. And that was that became tea. And that's how we know, you know, the, the tea leaf today. Um, yeah. And and, you know, he felt really uh, aware, but also peaceful from it. That's a combination of the caffeine that you get in green tea, but also the L-theanine, which is the very common component. Some people take L-theanine as you know, an individual supplement for that purpose and to help with sleep and things like that. Um, but each, you know, each herb kind of has its own story. Uh, often they were observing animals and what animals would do and what animals would go after in terms of digging up certain roots or eating certain plants. Um, it was a lot of experimentation. You know, the Taoists were famously uh, alchemists in a sense. You know, some of them tried to do different things, consuming different metals and things like that. So they were, you know, they were very experimental. Um, and fortunately, we didn't have to go through that experimental phase. We got you mm -hmm. know, the accumulation of 4,000 years of their experimentation and, and wisdom and figuring out what kills you and what actually works. Um, yeah. Yeah, lots of Taoists famously killed themselves by heavy metal poison. Yeah, right. I guess those are the, you know, Macri and all of that is an alchemist. They, they kind of put themselves through a very uh, aggressive um, evolutionary <laughs> process by which, you know, if you're doing the good stuff, you're going to make it and you're going to thrive and you're going to live in the ripe old right. age. Um, and if you mess up, well, then didn't go so well <laughs> hey, um yeah and i guess over thousands of years is really what it comes down to yeah and i, I think the lifestyle that they were living uh, would you say they were they were monks right so they, they probably had quite a reductionist lifestyle in that they could really observe any change because there was a lot of con constancy in their lives so when they would take a herb they probably would realize what what would happen quite quickly in their body yeah Absolutely. Very, very reductionist lifestyle indeed. Not, you know, not living as we do these days in cities with all kinds of overstimulation of all the senses, eating complex and crazy food, you know, very simple lives. As I said, a lot of time spent sitting still, observing the patterns of nature, uh, a lot of practice of Tai Chi and Qigong and things of that nature. Um, so to be very aware of the different energy center, centers of their body and the meridians. Uh, so, you know, even it's, I, I don't know whether it's completely true, or whether it's a bit of legend, but you know, they'll say that many advanced Taoists uh, can actually look at you and see the energetic meridians of your body. Um, mm -hmm. You know, th that may be the case or maybe not. It's one of those things you'll never really know unless you can, you know, transport into their consciousness. But yeah, well, well there's certainly those people around. Yeah. 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 No, I've, I've come people across that that would tell you certain things about like, oh, you only have one one kidney or something like that. I've, I've been part of, of conversations like that. So uh, there's certainly something that people can just pick up. And I guess it, it takes a lot of practice and, and, and stillness, yeah, to, to be so uh, receptive to, to what's happening in front of the eyes or to the body. Absolutely. Yeah. So, that's oh, so a, a unique group of people doing uh, self-experimentation and taking great notes and documenting it over time. That's the really other interesting thing too, is that one of the reasons why we know so much about the history of these herbs and the lore and legend of these herbs and, and where they come from and how they're used is that in, in the Chinese system and the Taoist system, they were amazing at documenting everything, which we don't see, you know, with uh, perhaps a lot of other indigenous herbal systems throughout the world. I see. I get you. That's amazing. So so they came up with these three groups. And so, so one was poisonous. So there must have gone a lot of war warfare going on back, back then. Anyway, probably not so relevant nowadays. I don't know. <laughs> and, and then you got the sort of more, um, you know, like emergency or, or, or really directed herbs, herbs that do certain things to uh, to illnesses that are they are temporary herbs, herbs here. Yeah? Right. And now, and now these I don't know if people call them the master herbs, but they sound like it because they they seem to be so intelligent or they make the body so intelligent that you can keep using them. And it sounds also do more than one thing depending on where the body is at. Yeah. 
Right, exactly. They very much will react to the internal state of your body and act on basic core systems of your body, such as the HPA axis or on the nervous system or on the adrenals and thyroid, that then it affects a lot of the master switches of your health, in a sense. And when you when you're flipping these master switches into the right place, a lot of things downstream start to go a lot better. So a lot of these have, you know, for example, we'll get into some more a little bit you know, later on, but to give a quick example, reishi mushroom is amazing at decreasing stress and anxiety. And we all know the absolute disaster that the excessive stress of our modern world and, you know, and lifestyles and works, you know, and, and everything uh, places on our health. And so when you can flip that switch to not be so reactive and so vulnerable to external stressors, well, then of course, so many aspects of your health are just going to, you know, naturally start to sort themselves out. Wow. So you could actually, is there any limit of how long you, you take these or how, how much you could take of something like reishi mushroom or is it? You know, it's, it's a great question because people start to hear about how, how good these are and think, okay, well, you know, if, if taking like half a teaspoon of a great reishi extract powder is good, well, maybe taking 10 teaspoons or 10 tablespoons even is even better. <laughs> well, you got to remember, you can even overdose and kill yourself by drinking too much water. So yeah. Even the simplest and most basic things that are good, dosage is still important. So kind of the traditional way that these herbs are consumed is in small doses on a daily or at least a fairly regular basis, like at least once a week over a long period of time. And you do start to have some immediate benefits. And then you also where the real magic happens is in the cumulative benefits that you know occur as they build up in your system over time, as your, you know, your body is protected from these external stressors and as your organs are tonified and your, you know, your hormone health comes into a good place, uh, you, you build this foundation of health that really, uh, create, you know, creates the foundation for an amazing life. Yeah. It's, it's a bit like finding the Holy grail when you know that you have found something that really supports you on a regular basis rather than, I guess, you know, that the, the typical, I guess people here, oh, this is healthy. So I eat a little bit of this and, you know, talking about food, for example, you know, and oh, this, this is meant to be good for me and so on. And then they figure out like, okay, flaxseed crackers, you know, they are really good for me, but actually they, they throw out my omegas, you know, and whatever, whatever, whatever happens and, um, finding something that is so, I guess, is it non-invasive? They're certainly not dangerous. And, and that, that's beautiful. You, it's, it's hard to overdo and you don't have to run to the, the doctor to know what to take necessarily if you realize like, okay, you know, I do that on a regular basis, not too much, not too little. And you have the continuous benefit. And I think that's just when people discover that, I, I don't know, I was stoked when I discovered it because I thought this is unreal. You can't actually do much, much harm to yourself if, if, if you stay in that limit. I mean, we do have to say that, you know, if people are on drugs and, and medications for, for specific health conditions, uh, should still always consult with your doctor. Oh, of course. Yeah. And something like, again, just to stay on the same example, reishi mushroom uh, can help lowering blood pressure. But if you, so if you had high blood pressure and then you're on medications to bring your blood pressure down and then you take reishi, which also brings your blood pressure down, you could end up with your blood pressure being dangerously low. So, yeah. uh, you know, when you are taking drugs for something and the herb works on that thing, you have to really, you know, approach it carefully and, and monitor carefully with the doctor to make sure... Okay it doesn't end up too far in the other direction because you, you may take yourself out of needing that drug and that drug is still pushing in the same direction and you go too far in the other direction, you know, and it can, it can then do yourself harm. But in, in, in most cases, you know, they're, they're, yes, very safe herbs. Um, you know, the, the first rule is do no harm and the, these herbs definitely, yeah, play by that rule. Wow. That's amazing. Um, just uh, to get that out of the way, what, what would be, other than following you, of course, online, and I will, I will give uh, a couple of, of links there to, to, to be able to see what, what you do and how you educate people, but do you, are you aware of any, any good source that you would recommend to people to start getting familiar with Taoism, if they, if they or not Taoism, but um, Taoist herbs? So definitely the number one book uh, in this area is... Uh, the Ancient Wisdom of the Chinese Tonic Herbs by Ron T. Garden. And he was a guy who spent a lot of time studying in Asia. And he was one of the first people uh, to kind of bring Chinese herbs and, and Taoist tonic herbs to a Western audience back in the 70s uh, in America. And this guy has such great and deep wisdom. And his book is kind of broken up into sections. It gives you some of the philosophy of the herbal system, some of the philosophy of, of yin and yang and the five elements and the the 12 meridians and, and uh, the, the three treasures, which we'll get into in a bit, and mm -hmm. then goes through these tonic herbs 
in a way that totally makes sense and, and kind of fits into this framework that the book gives you. And it's such a great place to start. I remember when I first read through it, it just blew my mind in the most incredible way. And I, so I just read it again and again and again. I just kept reading it over and over and over again. I was so amazed and inspired. Wow. This is, you know, in, in like my late teens, early 20s. Um, and it it's one of those ones where it's it's an easy read in many ways, but it's mm. it's fascinating and it's also super information dense. So you'll pick something new out of it that stays with you every time you read it. Wow, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. That's cool. Yeah, I interrupted you earlier. Do you want to touch a little bit sort of on the on the overall categorization of what, what a herb does in terms of the five treasures and yin and yang and so on? One of the, the core components of the Taoist health philosophy is this concept of the three treasures. And it is, it's deep and it's profound, yet easy to understand. And a lot of the Taoist stuff is this way. Like it, it will go as deep as you want to go with it, or if you only want to think about it for two seconds, it's still going to do you some good. Uh, so with the three treasures, they say these three treasures form your life. Now the three are Jing, J-I-N-G, Qi, spelled Q-I, and Shen, S-H-E-N. And so these, these form up your life and they often use the metaphor of a candle to describe them. They say the jing is like the wax and the wick. It's the basic form of the candle. Now, the way I like to describe it is that the jing is like your savings account of energy. It's your reserve energy. It's what you, you start out with a certain amount. Some people more, some people less. You inherit it from your parents, depending on how healthy they were. So we all know some people who come into life and even though they try to live really healthy all the time, they still kind of struggle. And, uh, you know, often they end up being the real health nuts because it's the only way they can even survive and just get by. They didn't start out with a lot of jing. They didn't, they didn't inherit a big trust fund from their parents. Uh, and they have to be really on top of it just to keep it all together. And they have to, you know, hopefully discover some of these herbs and techniques and work on building their jing. Um, but, you know, they get made fun of a lot because they're living this healthy lifestyle, yet they're, no, you know, on the, on the outside, maybe don't look healthier than their friends who's eating uh, McDonald's uh, and, and smoking cigarettes and, and they don't understand, you know, why. But it's because they started off with a right. very low amount of jing. Now, on the other hand, you have the people who start off with a ton of jing. They have, they're like inheriting this jing trust fund because their ancestors, you know, lived incredibly healthy lives and ate nutrient dense foods, probably, uh, you know, did not grow up in, in modern America, grew up, you know, either in, in the old world and, or, you know, in, in various areas where they still ate in a very traditional manner and spent time in the outdoors, were really physically active and all these things. And these people, they can often abuse their bodies and, and sort of get away with it. They're the ones who are making fun of the people who don't have gin because they say, look at me, I'm doing whatever I want and I'm you know just as healthy as you. So they got this big trust fund that they can float on for a while, but eventually it will run out. If they are using up this reserve at an accelerated rate, if they are uh, living off their savings rather than you know cultivating some some wisdom and being learning how to build their own you know, revenue stream to continue the, you know, the financial metaphor, uh, mm -hmm. to cultivate their own energy and, and take care of their health, they will suddenly one day run out. These are the people they go all out and then like at 55 or 60, they die of a heart attack after a very wild life and that's it. Yeah. They, they run out. So, you know, maybe, hopefully they learn to cultivate this energy um, and take care of themselves. But if not, they just go, go, go because they've never known what it feels like not to have this jing and then yeah. eventually it's gone. So it's like a life tank, yeah, like if you if you're a vehicle. So that's it, the, the tank that, you know, ideally you want to replenish. If you don't at one stage, it will be just empty. And some people have not much to start with, which means the ones who aren't looking after themselves, they would actually probably get sick quite quite quickly and, and struggle through life, especially if they don't replenish that tank and other people start with a lot. But it will run out eventually as well if they don't do something about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like when you're when you're in like an off-road vehicle and you have your your gas your gasoline or you know your where your petrol tank, um, and you've got then those extra tanks that you keep on the roof. That's your <laughs> reserve. That ideally you don't even want to have to tap into. If you're living a very balanced and healthy life, you are only using a very small amount of your jing. You use up a little bit as you go through life. Um, uh -huh. You use up more when you're stressed. You use it when you're. Um, uh, not sleeping well, you use it if you're partying too much, you know, drugs, alcohol, yeah. diet, any of these things, then you're going to be using up more of your jank. You're going to be tapping into that reserve savings account. 
So that's Jing. And then you have the second treasure, which is Qi. And this is your active moment to moment energy. This is your checking account. So this is where you are getting energy from the air you breathe and the food you eat. So ideally, you're having enough money coming in from your paycheck to your checking account and, and the food you're eating and the air you're breathing and the sleep you're getting every day so you don't have to tap into your savings and, and you don't have to shorten your lifespan. So if your chi is doing fantastic, you don't have to tap into your jing. The flame of the candle, it's the active part of the candle. And then the ultimate treasure uh, is called shen because you could think, oh, chi is great. I just want to have energy and I want to do things. But the ultimate purpose of a candle is not just to have a bright light. It's, it's to give off a lot of light. It's not just a flame. It's you want to give off a lot of light. So this is your shen. It's your higher self. To continue the financial metaphor, it is your nonprofit that you set up. It's your charity. It is your ability to affect those around you. It's your spirit, your higher self, the light in your eyes. So when you have a big candle and a big flame, naturally, you're going to give off a great light. Um, so, so that is why we're building this all in all is to be able to have, you know, a beneficial effect on others and, and the world around you and, and help other people yeah. out too. So is Shen something you can directly influence or do you, um, focus on the other two uh, treasures and that then includes the Shen? Um, oh. so, so it'll be easier to cultivate Shen if you've got strong Jing and strong Qi, but a lot of the herbs that we look at, um, you can take just as Shen tonics, things like uh, reishi mushroom or albizia flower or pearl powder. These are all Shen tonics that are going to really help to cultivate that higher self, balance your uh, you know, stress response, and so you're not as, as reactive to things. Um, and so even while you're in the process of building the Jing, it's great to have these to what they call stabilize the Shen. And, and you know, some people who have gone through uh, you know, illness or have gone through some trauma, the shen becomes what they call shaken uh, and, and reserved, and it kind of draws back. And so you see some kind of people who are like stuck in this fight or flight mode from you know having gone through some trauma or something like that, and their kind of spirit is just like curled back up into its shell, and it's just hiding for your life. Um, and it can you until they've really built a foundation for it, and then taken some of these herbs that can kind of you know open up the heart a little bit and, and take away the stress and make them feel safer. Um, it can help to, you know, turn things back around with, you know, of course the right, you know, psych psychological help and, and therapy and things like that. Yeah. And neurofeedback and all these. Sure. Wow. So yeah. So the personality is shaped by how strong these three treasures are and, and how well they're nourished. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate when, and also just to, to add in some terminology for people, when we talk about your Jing being depleted, this often plays out in, in what people are also looking at as being adrenal fatigue or uh, HPA axis dis dysregulation, where, where you get to, where you get depleted, you're depleting these reserves. And it can really send you into a downward spiral because as your Jing gets depleted, you become more fearful because you don't have much reserve. So you're kind of at a state where any little thing that goes wrong could be the end of you. You, you know, you don't have this strong foundation. You're, you're uh, very like wobbly and, and brittle. The littlest impact from something going wrong in your life could be the end. And so you become fearful that stress and fear and anxiety burns up more Jing and it gets you into this really negative downward spiral where your, your Jing becomes weaker. You get more scared and that burns more Jing and it can get really bad. But then yeah. if you can get in there with some sort of an intervention or you start taking some herbs and you start to slowly build this back up, it can turn things around and, and kind of save you from that really uh, sad and unfortunate snowballing experience that some people can fall into. Yeah, that makes sense. And to be a spokesperson of why the body might do that, I, I totally um, give them some, give, give the body some some props for that because I think it's good to amplify the bad at that moment to quickly catch on that something is wrong. Like you know, let's say, um, you know, something is going wrong, and, and and you know you're stressed, and therefore things get depleted. So that's the step one that you were talking about. And then the second step is actually that that then creates a, a downward spiral. At that moment, it's way more obvious to the body and, you know, hopefully to the consciousness of the person that something needs to change. So it's actually a good thing that it gets amplified quite quickly rather than, you know, you just keep going. Although in the Western lifestyle, that's often the case regardless because of the Western lifestyle. It's got to change. That's, that's Yeah, exactly. So, you know, in, in a sense, it's a positive thing. Taking the action steps. 
to, to make the change in our lives because we're so often, you know, in a groove of one way of living. It can be hard to bust out, but it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Oh, I get, I get that. That's great. So what, what would you say are the top, top five herbs for you that, that you would, would like to introduce to us? What, 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 what would that be? So um, one, uh, I'll expand on a little bit that we've mentioned a bit so far is reishi mushroom. Um, and then we'll continue into some others. So reishi is a mushroom that grows on trees, interestingly. So when we deal with a lot of these, what we call medicinal mushrooms, which are getting more and more popular these days, which is mm. amazing, it's important to distinguish them from mushrooms that grow on the ground. Um, these are kind of, as we talked about the different classes of herbs here, we're kind of also looking at different classes of mushrooms. These, so the, the tree mushrooms are kind of an elite immunologically potent mushroom that grows off a whole different substrate rather than growing out of the dirt it's growing from a tree so it's like a, a higher class of mushroom basically and when you look at the composition of reishi it has a number of things going on inside of it one of which is these long chain polysaccharides called beta glucans and if you were to you know go under a microscope and unravel these they'd actually be up to three feet long and they basically come into your body And your white blood cells chop them up into smaller pieces and they attach to your white blood cells and basically teach them how to do their job better. It's like an operating system upgrade for your immune system. Uh, wow. And so you see uh, not just an immune stimulation or immune suppression here, but dual directional immunological activity. So um, very often people who have autoimmune are very helped by this because if they have an overactive immune system, it helps to bring things down. Meanwhile, if the immune system is underactive, it'll help to bring things up. It's so amazing in this way. And you, you see benefits in terms of the macrophages and the natural T killer cells and things like that. So it's incredible for the immunity. And then it's also great for stress and anxiety. It has these terpenes in it, which are an alcohol soluble compound. So when you get reishi, you want to get what's called the dual extract because the polysaccharides, those beta glucans for the immune system, those will come out into a hot water extraction. And then these terpenes will not come out into the hot water. They're kind of shy of the hot water. They will wait and they'll only come out into alcohol. They're, they're alcoholics. <laughs> Those yeah, guys, right. they, they, they want a good drink. Um, mm. so I, I say that jokingly. Um, but what it means is you want what's called a dual extract because different of these different active compounds are going to respond to different uh, solvents and, and extraction methods. So what they'll do is they'll extract it into alcohol first the mushroom what they call the mark out of the alcohol set the alcohol extract aside which has now got the terpenes in it and then they'll do a hot water extract where they uh, boil it for many hours in the hot water and extract those polysaccharides take the mark out which doesn't really have much left in it anymore and set that aside now they'll boil down the hot water extract till it gets like a thick syrup combine it back with the alcohol now you've got this liquid uh which you know people would take as a tincture so some people will take like a, a reishi tincture and then uh, sometimes they go a step further and they'll spray dry it into a powder. Um, and, mm. and so you would get that either as a, as a bulk powder that you could, you know, do in a tonic or a smoothie, something like that, or add to your coffee. Um, or it will then maybe by some companies be encapsulated so you can just swallow capsules. Is that because of the convenience of having it as a powder or is the downside of actually eating these mushrooms or can't you eat, eat the whole mushroom anyway? You couldn't eat it in its raw form. The cell walls are made of chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N, which is one of the hardest substances in all of nature. So you could What eat it know? the same way that like you could eat like, uh, you know, a, a car seat um, or, or, you know, a piece of metal or, or you know, some bark from a tree, um, yeah. but you wouldn't get anything out of it. It would go through you kind of uncomfortably. Um, it's, yeah, there was a, a crazy story years back of a guy who ate a whole Boeing 747 airplane over time. Um, And just like piece one piece at a time, so you can eat you can eat it. <laughs> do, you, do you mean it like this person actually ate a plane? Yeah. Is he in the Guinness Book of the Records? Is he still alive? Yeah, it's insane. Oh, um, probably, that, that's it, a thing. A, a Boeing seven forty seven is not a superfood. Um, Gee, that's disturbing. So, um, talking talk, talking about these cell walls of the reishi, so they really got guarding their treasure, hey? Absolutely. Yeah. And so that's, yeah. that's why you need the, the alcohol and the, the hot water extraction um, to really crack open and break through that cell wall and, and get out those goodies from yeah. inside. Um, and so, yeah, with all these herbs, you know, there's 
some companies out there that will just sell them in what's called a raw or crude form where they've just taken the, the reishi and just powdered it down like that. Uh, and they sell it like that, which is unfortunate because some people yeah. don't really know when they buy it like that and wonder, well, why is this not really working? Right, because it's actually not bioavailable at that moment. Mm. Mm. Right, precisely. So um, it, it's important to get these herbs that have been processed in the right way so you can you know, get all the goodness out of them. Yeah, fantastic. What I, what I always like to ask is like, you know, and, and I think you, you sort of hinted towards it, like you, you really went into depth of, of the substances that come out of, out of the mushrooms and that they are really intelligent and that somehow things happen in the body. Is there a lot of research ar around these uh, Taoist herbs like like reishi that that would suggest that you know what you're just saying like basically the intelligence is in in the substance it comes into the body and you basically get an upgrade um it for your cells when you eat it uh amazingly reishi is actually one of if not the most well-studied herb in the world um extremely well studied in the areas of its immunological function um also in in stress reduction Uh, they, you know, they've they've also looked at it for things that it uh, failed to do, like um, did not significantly increase testosterone, for example. We can talk about some other herbs like ashwagandha that do help with that. But um, so reishi doesn't do everything. You know, it does a lot, but it, it won't do everything. Um, it got to you know meet some of these different herbs to have a whole bunch of friends that are going to help you out. It takes a village. Um, right. <laughs> but yeah, so so reishi also you know has been studied with. Uh, various diseases. It's been shown in studies to be very uh, hepatoprotective, so protective of the liver um, from, from various forms of toxicity, uh, So and, and helping with stress and anxiety, and also helping uh, with uh, social interaction for people who are, have uh, a bit of uh, social anxiety and things wow, like that. Really? Maybe that's why it's so chatty. I have, um, I have a reishi latte every morning and every night. I don't know how much, probably like a tea and a teaspoon and a half in the morning and at night, and that's... Uh, It tastes really good. I, I, I really love it. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, being from the Nordic country, sometimes that means that your liver is not the strongest. So I can I can certainly tell that, you know, I, I can feel the difference. And, of course, it has a, a lot to do with also the bringing the nerves right down. So I'm, there's also the side effect. Like, if I don't have it, I can I can tell that my nerves are a little bit more alerted than when I drink it. I, th I think it's, it's a really obvious herb to take. That's, I guess, what I'm saying. is like I can really see that. Really the, yes. It, yes. Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great because I know you're you're one of the hardest working people I know. Um, <laughs> there's been a lot going through your head. You know, you're very you, you got a heavy processing load going on at all times. So I uh, I I think it's great that you got that in your life. Yeah, right back to you. I'm sure you take quite a few different herbs through, during the course of a day. Hey. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So um, another one, which is one of my absolute favorites, is astragalus. This is a it's a root. Um, it's it's a root of sort of this like thin, bushy sort of a plant. And it uh, is the primary, or one of the primary, I would say, uh, chi tonics in the Chinese system. So benefiting that moment-to-moment -moment energy, vitality, cognitive function, immune system function. And when I was uh, spending some time with some incredible Taoist teachers in China back in 2012, um, you know, I was talking to them, and we're talking about Tai Chi, about you know the three treasures, about herbs, and. Um, you know, I said, well, which of these herbs would you absolutely want to make sure to take every single day? And they said, without a doubt, astragalus is the one because wow. it's not too fiery. It's, so it's not too like, you know, stimulating and intense, um, which can, is, is sometimes fun short term, but like can be a problematic long term. Like some really like hot red ginsengs can be too intense. Um, for, for some people anyways, you know, depending on constitution and age and things like that. But, uh, with, astragalus it's improving your chi so it's giving you more money in your checking account to work with so you don't have to tap into your reserves um yeah. it's it's also uh strengthening what they call the upright chi which is kind of the energy that gives you the ability to stand upright and and resist gravity and also helps support your organs in their place uh because as you age organs can kind of like prolapse and and fall down wow Th that herb does that yeah yeah so you know internal organs and also like for mm -hmm. females uh like you know their organs as well so um it's it's amazing in that way it also improves what's called the wei chi which is spelled w-e-i space q-i and this is what's considered to be like a surface level immunity it's like the front lines of your immune system it's a the way they you know kind of metaphorically describe it it's like a protective energy that runs over the surface of your skin so uh this is why you know uh astragalus is also great when dealing with ticks for example it, it makes it harder for them to to get you And so they don't want to come to you. 
right, they have a hard time getting you. Uh, and, and they're, they're, I don't know if it's, it's not clear whether that they're repelled or they have a harder time yes. making uh, suction on the skin. Um, wow, but also if you have been bitten by a tick, it's a great thing to take immediately as well for uh, preventative purposes of things like Lyme. That, that brings me um, to, a, to a little side question because um, when I think about ticks, I think especially about the kids in this area because, um, I mean, it's probably true to many, for many parts of the world, but I know that you know kids play outside a lot in the high grass and so on. Um, what about kids taking these types of herbs? Like, do you have to? Be, I, I'm sure you have to be more careful, and of course, check with your, you know, medical advisor, whoever that might be, and professional. But um, would would you say that that's an option? There's so it, it's something that has to be considered by the parent and and, and by the pediatrician. There's mm. very limited research on many of these herbs in uh, you know pediatric population. So okay. it's 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 hard for me to say with a high degree of certainty. Mm. You know, if you were going to go down that route, you definitely want to make sure you're adjusting the dosage properly for the weight of yeah. the child because they're uh, okay. you know, a yes. small fraction of your weight. So, mm -hmm. you know, an herb that you might take a teaspoon of, or say, like, let's say you take half a teaspoon of an herb, yes. um, you know, and, and they're like a fifth of your body weight, you know, even an eighth of a teaspoon might be real strong for them. So you have to, you know, just okay. do it like a tiny little bits. Um, depending on, on weight. But again, it's going to vary on an individual basis. And um, there's not a huge body of research out there for most of these herbs to, to say how they work. Yeah. To make this, this astrologous uh, example a little bit more tangible, um, how would you use it? Like, I, you know, as I said, I like the reishi, reishi latte. That's, that's really easy. That's, that's delicious. And I love that. Um, astragalus is a, is a really tasty herb I found, but how would you take that on a daily basis? Like, would you include that in your cooking or drinking or would you just take it in, in capsules or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's great because it is one of the most gentle tasting of all these herbs. Like reishi has a strong bitter flavor and mm -hmm. that, that's the active components in it. That's those beta glucans that have that bitter flavor. So with reishi, uh, the classic saying is the bitterer, the betterer. Oh, great. So that's a good taste. The more beta glucans are in there that are actually benefiting your immune system. If you have a reishi that doesn't have much flavor to it, it's not doing much for you. Yeah. Um, now, when we look at astragalus, it, it's dealing with different kinds of compounds in there. So it doesn't need to have that extreme flavor. And it actually has kind of like a, a very mild vanilla graham cracker kind of a taste to it. So it's very easy for people who are totally new to these things and maybe not even necessarily into health and healthy eating to get started on. Um, so you can, you know, my favorite way to start somebody on a new herb is yeah. to take um, a couple ounces, maybe two to four ounces or, or you know, something like uh, 50 to 100 milliliters of hot water and take about half a teaspoon of the herb and stir it up in there so it dissolves. And this is on an empty stomach. Sit somewhere quiet and drink that down slowly and just pay attention to how it makes you feel because that way you're not confusing its effects with anything else that's going on in your life. You're not confusing its effects with something else that you ate. Um, it's on an empty stomach so you're uh, getting optimal absorption. It's coming in with hot water. So it's opening up, you know, all the receptors. And, uh, cause when you take things cold, it's, it can be fun, you know, having ice creams and stuff, but we got lots of ice cream recipes and stuff for sugar free ice creams in our YouTube channel. But uh, for maximum potency, you do want to go, uh, warm with these herbs is really helpful. So that's a kind of a way of meeting the herb and getting to know it and understand how it works in your body and how it's affecting you and how it makes you feel. And then you can go into doing more complicated drinks with it. Like you could make yourself kind of like a hot chocolate or we have our different, like we have a, a product line called the elixir blends where we have drinks that are like a chai caramel or a chocolate drink. Or yeah, a I like that. We've got astragalus in all these and that's, you know, you just blend it with like, like some, you know, coconut milk or almond milk. Yeah. I'm so excited. I, I think what we should do, um, everyone who comes on the show, like I normally have a hot chocolate or something um, equivalent with me, but because your chassis can actually be sent, you know, around the globe quite, quite easily. Since, since we send people at the microphone anyway, we might actually include a couple of those chassis as well so that we sort of connect no, no, <laughs> also over, over herbs like that. And, you know, having, having something like, like your uh, drinks, I mean, definitely one of yours. I yeah, absolutely love that. Well done. That really so cool. Yeah, there would be. Yeah, let's talk. Yes, you know, I have these so many ways. Like um, uh, two days ago, we made a, a zucchini coconut bread, which like have, it's almost tastes like uh, the texture is like cake. It was incredible. We're going to be posting a recipe video uh, for it in a couple of weeks. Uh, probably by the time this is up, you can you can see the yes. recipe for it. Um, and and put about a tablespoon of astragalus in there. Uh, so, so you can start incorporating into your cooking as you kind of, you know, when you have it on its own in the beginning, you also get to know the flavor of it. So that will kind of instruct you on how you can use it 
in different dishes. Something like reishi, like you talked about, goes really nice in chocolatey flavored things because the bitter of the cacao helps to cover and, and mask the intense bitter of the reishi. Uh, whereas in, in milder flavored things like, like a bread or a, like a vanilla cake, something like that, astragalus goes a lot more easily into there because it's, it, it plays nicer flavor wise. Yeah, I love it. Oh, thank you. So, um, you know, talking about flavors, um, the next herb I wanted to talk about is Shizandra. And this is a Chinese berry, little red berry, and its Chinese name is Wu Wei Tzu, which means the five flavor fruit, because it is simultaneously sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and pungent. Um, <laughs> when you have this, you like take a tincture of it under your tongue, or when you have the fresh berries, it's amazing because it almost like explodes a part of your brain that's trying to figure out what you're tasting because you're getting hit with all this stuff at once. It's like, wow, what is that? <laughs> and you know this this multidimensional nature of schizandra is reflected in the way that it works in the body. We talked about the three treasures earlier. Schizandra is at what's called a three treasure herb. It builds the jing, qi, and the shen. It has a, a locking nature to it, meaning it helps you stop you from leaking your jing. It helps prevent you from stressing effectively. Mm. It helps you lock in information as well. It's a great herb for people who are learning and studying. Uh, they did studies in China where they had two groups, one group that was drinking coffee during studying for exams, and the other group that was taking Shizandra. The Shizandra group outperformed the coffee group in exam results, which is awesome. Yeah, great to hear. <laughs> yeah, and so this one, it also helps to protect from the elements. Um, so it's protecting you from the, the effects of the elements in your skin, for example, like the, the sun and the wind uh, and cold. Um, can have an aging effect on the skin. Shizandra helps to protect from that. It's known for really helping to give radiant and beautiful skin. And part of the way that's happening is that it's also a liver detoxifier. That's it. What's really cool is that it's a stage one and stage two liver detoxifier. Some people are better at stage one or stage two liver detox genetically. And so they'll be like detoxing fast through stage one, but then they'll get a, a buildup in kind of the, the production line of detox in stage two and, oh, and end up with some problems. Shizandra supports both stage one and two liver detox. So it's, it's amazing. Oh, beautiful. I see. So I, are you actually able to take all of these three herbs in one day? Like, I, you know, I, I, I do want to become more social and uh, from the reishi and, you know, upgrade my, my cells and, and obviously all the other good things that it does. And then astragalus, you know, I'm hunching a little bit. So it's good to take the astragalus. And again, it has so many other things to offer. And then I also like the shiz shizandra, which I actually quite like the flavor and, and you know, and, and that has, has certain benefits. So can you, you know, I'm just thinking about it. When I do an upgrade on my computer, I normally do one at a time. But um, I guess there's no limit how often I, I do that. So does, can the body, I guess that's, that's my question, like if I would take all three at once, which I won't because, you know, it's not as, a, it's not as, as nice of an experience, but if I would, would the, the body still have the benefits and know what to do with each part? Your, your body is super intelligent, first of all. Um, hmm. You know, if you look at the, the, the diets of indigenous people, for example, the variety of things that they ate in terms of the number, like the hundreds of different plants that they really? ate, um, just blows away the, the very narrow variety. Yeah, what, do we, what do we do, eat? like 20 maybe? I don't, I don't know, do you have the number in your head? But like someone who's really eating a lot of different stuff will eat you know, maybe 40 or 50 different ingredients if you include spices and things like that. And that's right? unusual, right? Most of us probably are down to what, like one or two digits, eh? In the mainstream, it's like corn and soy, and some, you know, beef, which is fed corn and soy. And so it's just like the corn and soy diet. Corn and soy, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, that's, that's on one end of the spectrum. But, um, you know, your body can, can handle a lot. Now, that said, I still support, you know, the first, couple, first time or first couple times you're taking a new herb. It's great to have it alone and, and really experience it solo. It's like if you uh, were going on a date with somebody for the first time, you would not invite them probably to a group dinner, you'd want to go one-on-one -on -one to really get to know them. Yeah, that makes sense. And that would be my approach anyways. Um, if you wanted to connect with them and, and learn more about them and understand them and feel closer, if you want to, you know, if you have some issues and you need to keep a distance, like you do what you got to do. But <laughs> um, I think, <laughs> you know, if you really wanted to connect and, and learn and understand, you would go one-on-one. -on -one. So it's great. The first time you do an herb, go one-on-one -on -one, and then you can introduce it to your other friends. And that's like starting to take it with some other herbs. And these herbs are, you know, traditionally 
what's unique about tonic herbs is they they can be used individually, but they're also very often used in formulations and and with other herbs. So it's great to have them all available, or you know, start off with a few and you can kind of build your your repertoire and collection and and, and arsenal uh, as you may like to call it as you go. Um, but you you can have them around and then you take them when you feel like it. You know, depending on what's going on. If you you need to you know focus on some relaxation or you know. You know it's going to be a challenging day and you want to modulate that stress and keep your immunity up. Reishi is amazing. Um, if, if you're going to be really involved in physical activities, uh, astragalus or, you know, the next one I was going to talk about, cordyceps are great. Astragalus was traditionally very popular amongst people who had, uh, were doing hard labor and were working out, outdoors, doing a lot of stuff, physical labor and out in the cold. Uh, it was very popular for that. And it was, you know, traditionally said to strengthen the extremities, the arms and the legs. So... Mm-hmm they're great tools to have and you get to know them over time and through self-experimentation and through reading and, and learning. And then you can kind of become a little wizard with them and, and use them to really optimize your life. Wow. Yeah. Sounds great. I, I sometimes travel quite a bit, so I, you know, it's always good to have like a little parcel of, you know, all these different treasures, all the, all these different herbs with me so that, you know, when you feel that you go more for that, if you can't sleep, you probably take a little bit more reishi and, you know, if you need that little bit of extra, then you would probably go more for cordyceps or something like that. Especially good when you're traveling, right? Cause you want the immunity, you have to adjust to different time zones in terms of sleeping, everything, you know, when you're traveling in, in some senses can be a little more stressful because you're dealing with a novel environment, which is exciting, but can also be, you know, a stressor because you got to be mentally on all the time. You can't go mm-hmm. you know, into autopilot really when you're traveling, which is one of the beauties of it, but it's also, you know, it can, can wear you out a little bit. Yeah. And, and what I've found, um, I have, I have seen talk, people talking about tonic herbs is also that it sort of shields you. And, and what I thought was amazing, we had uh, John Bump- Bumpus on the show and he t- talked a little about, a lot about uh, minerals and, and how if you have a really mineralized body, detoxification is not as much of a problem because you won't get as toxic to start with you know like he brought up that example which blew my mind is that um if if there is no calcium available if uh, or no zinc available the body short term prefers to take a heavy metal than no metal because it needs to think about just the survival long term not such a good idea but you know in the short term it might and and what he would say is like if you have enough minerals you won't you won't take as much heavy metals on board because the body is actually not the body is really intelligent and it's not interested to take that on board because it has better things and I'm sure with tonic herbs it's a similar similar thing right like if you if you protect yourself and nourish I guess while you go through a for the body stressful travel or whatever it might be um, you're probably less prone another great example of what you're mentioning is like with iodine for example in your in your thyroid you have these iodine receptors uh, but if they're left empty you can get those filled up with other halogens like bromide and uh, fluoride and, and chlorine and, and these other toxic things that will block up those receptors if they're left empty. It's like a game of musical chairs. And uh, in, in a sense, this also plays out with the herbs. Um, not that the herbs have a, a dietary requirement per se, but uh, they are going to be optimizing your body's own detoxification pathways naturally, especially if you look at things like reishi and schizandra that are really you know, working on the liver and helping to cleanse the blood and things like that. And it's going to help. I mean, I I still think that in the modern world, we have to be a little more aggressive about detoxification because the solutions that worked, you know, in in a more primal environment when we weren't in an an industrial world with, you know, pollution and heavy metal toxicity and all these things uh, might have worked great back then to detoxify, you know, things that were uh, in, in more natural environmental toxins and metabolic toxins and things of that nature. But I think in the world that we are now looking at things like, you know, chelation therapy for heavy metals, of course, done under the guidance of a doctor who really knows how to set up the program, right. And using infrared saunas, um, you know, not just for detox, but also for, for stress and things like that. I'm, I'm a, a huge fan. I kind of wish I was over. I wish we, I was there. <laughs> yeah, this sauna at the moment is actually not working. You can see there's no ceiling on it, maybe. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I love them too. Believe me. <laughs> hey, um, maybe, maybe we we share one more herb. I, I'm sure I have you on the show again if if you find time and um, we can make it work because um, there is so much knowledge and I know you have also really specific knowledge on um, on hormones and 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 female health and and so on like you know the list goes on and i always love like i always really a treasure the the time with you but um (laughs) i won't take more much more time uh from you but like is there one one other herb you you might want to want to share 
I, you know, we were going to talk about cordyceps, but instead, let's for the last herb, let's yeah. take a jump over the Himalayas, go okay. on a trip over to India real quick, and because uh, the amazing herbs of the world don't only come from China. Um, so oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, right. coming out of India is ashwagandha. Um, mm. This is known as the Ayurvedic ginseng, although it has no botanical relation to ginseng, just you know, in, in name only. Uh, and so this herb is amazing. It is probably one of the premier, if not the greatest adaptogenic herb in the entire world. It helps to balance stress and anxiety, but at the same time improves energy and endurance. So like we have these different functional chocolates, we use it in our tranquility chocolate and our energy chocolate because of how well it works in both of those directions. Uh, it's very supportive of the, the endocrine system for healthy hormone production, supports thyroid function, which is huge because, um, you know, I, I don't know the statistics for Australia, but I know in, in America, um, 20 million people have thyroid, some form of thyroid disease and 60% of them aren't even aware of it. Um, so it's something that goes very underdiagnosed and ashwagandha is an incredible supporter of, of thyroid health. And it's actually shown to be quite effective for helping horm uh, hormone production in men, specifically of testosterone. And it's not that it stimulates testosterone production directly, they, is what they're finding, um, but that it decreases stress and anxiety so much that the body doesn't have to spend the energy on the production of cortisol. It can downregulate cortisol production, you know, the stress hormone and the adrenaline, and can go back to healthy testosterone production. Um, so it, it takes you out of the fight or flight so you can, you know, your body can focus on its more long term health strategy rather than Beautiful. purely on immediate you know, uh, uh, survival. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that's an amazing one. It's one of my absolute favorites. And again, like the, the, the body just understands the information that it comes with, reads it, and uh, is able to do things that it would not otherwise. Yeah, and it's so potent too. Like, you know, other herbs you have to get, sometimes have to take a little bit more, but with uh, ashwagandha, in, in the studies, they, they are taking like between 300 to 600 milligrams uh, once or twice a day, which is a, a very small amount. We're talking like, you know, down in the range of like a, a 16th to an eighth of a teaspoon. Um, wow. And it's having a tremendously powerful effect. Yeah, that is amazing. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about it, how difficult can it be to put, you know, like have, have a little bit of a teaspoon every morning if it has such a radical effect on your health in the positive way? Yeah, yeah. Gee, we should learn that at school, I reckon. Like, you know, there's certainly, I can see a wave of so much information that is just verified also by research over and over again. And it really should just hit the masses so that people understand that there is something that is quite easy to do and has a radical effect. Yeah. Yeah, that's what inspired me so much in the beginning when I started to learn about this. It was like, I started to experience my first few, you know, superfoods and, and tonic herbs. And it was like, wow, these are making me feel so amazing. How is it possible that I've been alive for, you know, 18, 19 years and I didn't know about all this? What else is out there? And that, you know, in the beginning just sent me off down this, uh, you know, rabbit hole of, of research and experimentation. And the more I learned, the more I tried, the more I tried, the better I felt, the more I you know, the more I, the better I felt, the more I wanted to learn it. It just turned into this incredible cycle uh, that you know brought me here to today. <laughs> Great. I, I guess you know you came as a really big candle too. You had a lot of a lot of storage there already from from good genes and all the rest of it and good luck. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guardian of the candle, but I didn't make it. <laughs> Definitely a good guardian too. Awesome. Well, thanks for that. I, I have a couple of questions that we ask everyone who comes on the show. And um, number one would be the first question would be like what what. What is it that gets you out of bed every day? What are the three things that, that you're inspired by that, that makes you do what you do? I would say um, the first one is the adventure. Um, you know, my, myself being a, a, a kind of a young entrepreneur um, and, and this is my first you know, business I've ever really done myself. And it's, you never know what's gonna happen as a business owner. And, in the beginning, you can kind of get a little bit worn down by it and it can get stressful, but then you just kind of get to a point where you realize that, you know, it's always going to be something uh, that's going to be challenging. And you just kind of em embrace that and, and every day is going to be a, a new challenge and a new adventure. And, um, you know, you learn lots of new skills and, and develop new abilities along the way by necessity. And so it's not necessarily the, the easiest path through life, but it's, it's an adventurous one for sure. And, you know, what's life without some adventure? Um, so I think, you know, the adventure of the whole experience. Um, I am very fortunate to be in a beautiful relationship with my partner, Ana Blanca, and she makes me insanely happy. So that's an, another big reason. 
Um, and let's see, a, a third reason would be um, trying to build just a, the hope of building a better future. Um, not, you know, for myself, for those around me, ultimately, I would, you know, hope to have some impact on a, a, the greater world. Uh, I'm grateful to many aspects of social media for the ability to share educational information and, and, and interact with others on a broader scale than I ever would have been able to. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an amazing experience and, and opportunity that we have nowadays. Um, you know, you've got your own, basically you've got your own radio show. It would have been hard to land a, a gig as a big time international <laughs> DJ. On the side, right? Yeah. Every second Friday. There's, yeah, exactly. You can't really do that otherwise. So it's, yeah, it's true. It's a, uh, it's an amazing time we live in and I just, you know, want to make the most of it. Yeah. And, and, and well done for, you know, being in one of the hotspots for, for wellness and for all of that knowledge and innovation because LA Hollywood is really like where it's at. And whenever I am there and, you know, I connect with you, I'm just blown away what's accessible. And, and if you want and get out there and, and find there, there are the people that you find that just have knowledge that, yeah, just upgrades your whole experience, I guess. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of the, the, epicenter of the of the you know modern health scene but there's great stuff going on all around the world it's always you know interesting to, to travel to different parts as well and um oh, we'd love to make it so much of health is, is connecting with nature and so it's amazing to get into different parts of the world and connect with different uh, aspects of nature too great should we make a show just some travel recommendations because you have you got around as well and yeah i'm sure that for for health nuts like ourselves or you know wellness interested people there there's great places even within the us that, uh, other than than the west coast um second question would be like what's one of your favorite favorite things during the day like what you know how do you like to pass your time like what's something that really rocks your boat um surfing is my great passion um so that's I, I kind of grew up going to the beach fairly often and took up surfing when I was like 10, 11 years old. Uh, and I've been absolutely hooked ever since I was, you know, I've always been very grateful to my dad for spending many, many hours taking me to the beach and just hanging out on the beach or taking a nap in the car while I went out surfing, you know, when I was, you know, 14, 15, and then 16, I got my license and I was just going to the beach as much as possible. And it's just such a beautiful way to interact with nature in a, in a dynamic form. Um, it's, you know, beyond just a, an exercise, it's kind of like a, an active dance with nature. It's something different than many other nature activities in a way, you know, something like mountain biking or snowboarding, they're, they're both, you know, going for a run on the beach. It's all great, but you're on a, a for the most part, a static surface. Um, whereas surfing, it's, it's dynamic. You never know, uh, what's about to happen. So it's, it's makes you feel very alive. Yeah. You must be really in the vortex. I saw a picture with you and Lee Hamilton at one stage, I think. So, um, you certainly, you know, Oh yeah. Really installing a sauna at his house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that how it happened? I thought you saw, saw him at the beach either way. <laughs> yeah, no, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, last question. Why do you think we're here? Why, why do you think we exist? I, I vacillate, I think, between different thoughts on this. Um, you know, in, in one sense, uh, the, the explanation that, that we are consciousness kind of reflecting on itself um, and, and kind of just like a, a social experiment created by greater consciousness is, is one thought that kind of resonates with me in a way. Um, from a totally different perspective, we're here to love. Um, and then from the other side, like we're here to, to learn, you know, life is constantly filled with radical learning opportunities, some of which are fun and some of which, you know, can be painful, but uh, you learn. Oh, thanks for sharing. I think they, none of them really contradict each other anyway. I think it can be all three. Yeah. Ah, oh, cool. Sage, thank you so much for making time. I learned so much and I'm sure our audience as well. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. 